Welcome, and thanks for joining me on this intrepid journey as we explore and uncover mysterious and elusive tales of some of the world's most famous lost and forgotten treasures. There's something about treasure and the act of seeking it that has intrigued humanity since time began. From ancient rituals, to buried pirate treasure, to hordes of fascinating and mystical artifacts, acquired through war and brutal conquests, through to tracing our history in order to understand our past. I have long been fascinated by treasure and the journeys in which humanity has long embarked on in order to acquire it. The search for historical clues, precious materials, and immense knowledge. But for me, it's more about the immersive stories than the riches and power sought out by the explorers who seek such treasures. Because for the majority, it's only the stories, myths, and legends that in the end, remain. While the rest is lost to history. And in some way, it's fascinating in itself, as it opens the doors for further stories to be retold. So you see, the real treasures are the stories themselves. In this episode, we'll be exploring and uncovering an opulent and mysterious tale, one that has been the subject of much investigation, theory, and rumor throughout time as to the truth behind this ornate treasure. And, as we all know, with treasure, it isn't always size that matters, especially in this unordinary case. And with that said, let's embark on this cryptic and elusive story together. The Jewels of the Order of St. Patrick Also commonly referred to as the Irish Crown Jewels or the State Jewels of Ireland. In 1783, King George III, who was the King of Great Britain and Ireland at the time, reigning from 25th of October 1760 until his death in 1820, who by request of the then Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, created the Order of St. Patrick. And while it wasn't in order to consume large amounts of stout and revel in celebration, as one might assume, it was almost certainly the subject of those whom likely did so regularly within its ranks. The illustrious Order of St. Patrick is a British order of chivalry, of which was created to spawn knights. And the Knights of the Order of St. Patrick, by all accounts, was a very exclusive club. The statutes of which the order restricted its membership to only men, men who were appointed as both knights and gentlemen. In essence, those who were noted as having three generations of noblesse, which plainly means those with ancestors bearing coats of arms on both their mother's and father's heritage lines. And to shield membership even further to the order, the honour could only fall to Irish peers and British princes a closely guarded order, to say the least. Despite the origins of the Order of St. Patrick, it only lasted until 1922, while most of Ireland had independence as an Irish free state, a dominion which was known as the British Commonwealth of Nations. And while the order does still exist to this day, it has not produced knights within its ranks since 1936, with the order's last surviving knight, Prince Henry, Duke of Gloucester, who passed away in 1974, essentially closing the lid on the secrets within. Now that we've had a tipple, let's take a plunge into the sands of the hourglass and rewind to a point in time that marks some significance to the order and those within its ranks, where at the investiture of new knights as members to the order, as well as other formal ceremonial events, both the Sovereign and Grand Master of the Order of St. Patrick were each adorned with the most ornate regalia, or insignia depending on your preference. Two pieces of jewellery that by all accounts were mesmerising on the eye, a densely jewelled star and badge regalia, which in total both accounted for a staggering 394 precious stones. Stones which originated from the English crown jewels of Queen Charlotte and the Order of the Bath Star of her husband, George III. First, the heavily embellished Diamond Star of the Grand Master, 
Imagine a shape similar to an old, yet very ornate British police badge, is the simplest way to describe it. Composed of brilliance, Brazilian stones of the purest water, precisely four and five eighths by four and a quarter inches, consisting of eight points with four greater and four lesser, which enclosed from the center a cross of rubies and a trefoil of emeralds, encasing a sky blue circle of enamel with the words inscribed on the back in rose diamonds. The Latin motto, Quis separabit, translating to who will separate us, with a more modern translation of which reads, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, an inscription as you might expect of a historical piece such as this, the piece holding a historical value of 14,000 pounds, equivalent to 1,333 horses at the time, with a modern day value of approximately 1.6 million pounds. The second piece, the embellished diamond badge of the Grand Master, as I describe it with the likeness of a shape to that of a mid-century oval locket, brilliantly set in pure silver with a trefoil of emeralds on a ruby cross, also encasing a sky blue circle of enamel, also with the words inscribed in rose diamonds, the Latin motto, Qui Seberabit, surrounded by a wreath of trefoils and emeralds the whole of which is enclosed by a circle of large, single Brazilian stones, above a crowned harp and loop of diamonds, also of Brazilian stones, totaling a size of 3 and 3 eighths by 2 and 5 eighths inches, holding a historical value of 16,000 pounds, equivalent to 1,523 horses, a modern day value of approximately 1.8 million pounds. Certainly, both price tags fitting of royalty. During 1831, the original ordinance of 1783, which were slightly more opulent, were replaced as part of the order's restructuring. The dazzling invigorated jewels assembled by Rundle and Bridge, a London jewelers founded in 1787 by Philip Rundle and John Bridge. On March 15 of 1831, the newly handcrafted jewel replacements were dispatched from London to their forwarding destination in Dublin, travelling with the 18th Earl of Errol, were delicately placed within a mahogany box, along with a document declaring a description of the jewels of the Order of St. Patrick, made by command of His Majesty the King, William IV, for the use of the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, and which are crown jewels. Now. When the regalia were not in use or being maintained, their care fell to the Ulster King of Arms and kept in a tightly secured bank vault. When in 1903, the Ulster King of Arms office, currently situated in the Dublin Castle complex, moved from Birmingham Tower to the Bedford, or Clock Tower. The jewels, now having been transferred to a more secure safe, was to be safely stored in a recently constructed strong room at the new site. However, the new safe was all but too big to pass through the entrance to the new strong room, and as such, Sir Arthur Edward Vickers, a genealogical and heraldic expert, the current Ulster King of Arms, made the decision in the meantime to instead relocate the safe to his personal library while a solution was conceived. At this point, there were several latch keys to the library's location that were kept in the possession of Vickers and his staff, while the two keys to the safe where the regalia were securely stored, were tightly guarded on Vickers' person, safe and sound, one might assume. However, Vickers was known to enjoy a tipple or two while on night duty, and it is said that Vickers once awoke from a binge session to discover the St. Patrick Order's jewels firmly adorned around his neck. Beyond that unthinkable appearance, the regalia made one final appearance by the Lord Lieutenant the 7th Earl of Aberdeen on St. Patrick's Day of 1907, after the event of which the jewels are said to have been placed back into the security of the safe on the 11th of June, where, once again, not long after, Vickers had another attempt at displaying the jewels by showing them off to an undocumented visitor to his office. Vickers clearly obsessed with the regalia's allure. Later, upon inspection of the regalia's status quo on July the 6th, 1907, it was discovered that the jewels had all but disappeared from the safe, without a single trace, along with some precious family jewels Vickers had previously inherited. 
also missing with the collars of five knights of the opulent order. Now, following a police report, an investigation was established by the Dublin Metropolitan Police, who began their search to recover the jewels, issuing out posters declaring the suspected theft and, as mentioned earlier, included the detailed description of the opulent regalia jewels. To aid in the investigation, Detective Chief Inspector John Kane from Scotland Yard burst onto the scene to assist in the case of the theft, though his findings were never released. However, within his unofficial findings, it is said that Kane is reportedly to have named the suspect, despite his findings being suppressed by the Royal Irish Constabulary. As for Vickers, he was found to not have taken proper care of the precious and valuable regalia jewels as the official custodian of the regalia, and as a result, both Vickers and his staff were all resigned from their positions, despite Vickers pleading his innocence. As to the whereabouts of the treasure of the regalia jewels of the Order of St. Patrick, the elusive case went stone cold. And with that, came countless rumours and theories as to the location of the dazzling jewels of the Order of St. Patrick, and as to where, when and why the jewels were the subject of a heist. For now, the ideas range from the jewels being stolen by political activists, to the jewels being smuggled to the United States, to a tale of a mistress whom Vickers frequented, by whom he gave a copy of the keys to the safe where the jewels rested, who is reportedly said to have fled to Paris with the jewels. Another, to members of staff who engaged in a debauchery cover-up, as well as a plot by unionists who were set on embarrassing the Liberal government, where the jewels were later returned to the royal family. The plots thickened, as tales of everyone who could have been involved was, and they were all pointing the finger at each other. For now, the conspiracy twists, turns, and intertwines deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, all the while the opulent jewels of the Order of St. Patrick are and continue to remain a lost and forgotten treasure. One that may never again be adorned by Grandmaster, Knight or Display Cabinet ever again. And with that, the silent search has become nothing more than a tale of loss and a conspiracy for those who intend to create their own version of the story. Well, this has been a puzzling and elusive story of the lost and forgotten Jewels of the Order of St. Patrick. Throughout this strange and evasive journey, we are undoubtedly again presented with more unexplainable questions than obvious answers. At the same time, we have been and remain mesmerized by the story. Join me next time for another episode of Lost and Forgotten Treasures. I'm your intrepid storyteller, Lost and Forgotten Treasures is an audio cast written and produced by me, Roger Adams, with the help, of course, from the internet, whose archives from multiple contributors have allowed me to research, interpret, and retell these stories. I hope you've enjoyed traveling with me through time, and whether you found some answers, liberated your ears, or merely just found this story intriguing, I hope you'll join me on the next. For now, keep searching for your treasure, whatever it may be. Until next time.